table with respect to each other at least. And you can take this argument and argue that the other hotspots on Earth are also stable. They are certainly not completely stable and over longer geological periods they do move around, but for this purpose they serve us very well. So hot spot trails can be used to figure out how the plates are moving in this reference frame. And these hotspot analyses fit very well with what we have measured recently with GPS. But keep in mind that with GPS, uh, we measure just the last few seconds if you take uh, the life of the Pacific plate as one day. Also, the plates really move at a rather continuous and maybe only gently varying velocities. This is a diagram showing the distance from Hawaii along this volcanic island chain and the age of the volcanoes. And if you plot these two, then you can fit a very, very good straight line, meaning that the plate moves with 10 centimeters a year over this stable hotspot. And look at this here, over the past 30 million years, which is quite a significant time, the plates have really moved with a constant velocity. So, until now we talked about plates and we re really regarded them as uh, rigid and the boundaries between the plates as something which is sharp, like a, a, nut, uh, like a cut with a knife. Um, the rest of this lecture I will treat plate boundaries as uh, very, very sharp boundaries. But I just want to show you a picture to which we will come back later, showing that the plate boundaries, in fact, are not always completely sharp. So here is uh, a picture of uh, Eastern Europe going to the east of Asia, and these dark areas are zones which are called diffuse plate boundaries. Diffuse plate boundaries. In these areas, for example, the Himalayan chain, it is not possible to put your finger on the plate boundary itself. It is a white zone at which basically the two plates deform. It is like a, a deformation zone. So keep in mind plate boundaries are not always completely sharp. They have a certain width. But in today's lecture, we will treat them as sharp lines to understand the geometry. OK. Of course, the Earth is more or less a sphere in first approximation. And the plates are on this sphere, which doesn't change its size or not significantly, as we know. And so we have to understand the geometry of motion of plates on a sphere. And uh, the basis of that is um, done using Euler poles. Euler has shown that if you have two rigid shells on a sphere and you move these shells with respect to each other, then at any given point, the velocities of these two plates with respect to each other can always be described by rotation around one pole. And this is called the Euler pole. So to show it uh, in this diagram, there are two plates on this imaginary planet. So it's a sphere, first of all, and we have divided the sphere into two plates, just for the purpose of illustration. The plates are called A and B. If the plates are moving with respect to each other, then you can describe this motion by a rotation around a common Euler pole. So for these two plates, this is where the Euler pole is. 
So remember, this is not the North Pole or the magnetic pole of the Earth. This Euler pole can be anywhere on the Earth. But the Euler pole is just one of the two numbers that you need to describe plate motions with respect to each other. Okay? So if the Euler pole is here, the only other thing that you have to know to calculate velocities between the plates is the angular velocity. What is angular velocity? It is the rotational velocity around the Euler pole. Okay? And in this equation here, it is expressed as uh, omega, which is radians per year. So, now if I want to calculate at any given point uh, along this, these plate boundaries the velocity, what I have to put in is the radius of the sphere, the sinus of the distance between the Euler pole and the position in angles, in, in radians, and this is the angular velocity. And with this formula, now I can go anywhere along these plate boundaries, for example at this point, or this point, or this point, and I can calculate the local velocity of the two plates with respect to each other. And you can see that uh, if uh, in, in this case the velocity here is small and then it increases because you go away from the Euler pole, so the plates are moving apart faster and faster, and then it will decrease again until you go to the other Euler pole. Here there is a divergent movement and on the other side there is a convergent movement. The plate boundaries which are divergent have ridges and also the so-called fracture zones. And these are very interesting features. Um, I will make a drawing for you. So this is how these divergent plane boundary, plate boundaries look like. These are the ridges. And on the ocean floor, you often find little mountains or uh, some kind of a structure along these fracture zones. Okay, so here is a ridge. Spreading like this. And this is a fracture zone. The interesting thing is that there are quite long lineaments on the ocean floor called the, the fracture zones. But if you measure the seismic activity, then you will only find earthquakes here and a little bit less along the actual ridges. These are the seismically active parts of the fracture zones. Here, there are no earthquakes at all. And the explanations of these uh, fracture zones has, has been one of the very important breakthroughs in plate tectonics. Of course, what is happening is that these fracture zones connect these segments of the ridges, and there is a motion this way. So this is a dextral strike slip motion. And these fracture zones are basically just a remnant of a, an, an old active part of this transfer zone. Okay, so here there is no motion at all. This is plate A and this is plate B. 
So keep in mind that although this is a long linear segment, the activity is only here. This is where there is tectonic activity. So in the famous book of Cox and Hart, it is shown like this. These are the fracture zones and these parts are the seismically active zones. Now, if you go back to here, in the previous picture, you can see these lines, which are the fracture zones. And looking at this sphere, you will immediately see that the fracture zones lie on small circles, which all have their center and the Euler pole. Okay, so all these fracture zones lie on small circles. And this small circle analysis is one of the ways to actually determine the Euler pole for plate motions. And this has been done for quite a lot of fracture zones in the Atlantic. And then for each of these fracture zones, you find the small circle and you plot a great circle, which is perpendicular to the small one, and they all intersect in a small region, and this small region is where the Euler pole is for these two plates. Okay? So, on the sphere, the fracture zones are small circles, and if you analyze these small circles, then you can find the Euler pole, and of course, the fact that you can actually do this analysis with fracture zones that have evolved over tens of millions of years means, again, that the motion of the plates is a, quite a steady one. It doesn't change very quickly. Of course, if the plate motion would change every 100,000 years in dramatic ways, you would never get such stable fracture zones. And here is uh, from one of the textbooks all these normals to the small circles giving you the Euler pole for the North American and the European plates. So if you know the radius of the Earth, if you know the angular velocity, and if you know the position of the Euler pole, you can basically calculate the motion of all the plates on the surface of the Earth. And um, one of the really remarkable little tables from plate tectonics is simply a list of the Euler poles for each of these plates, plus the angular velocities. And if you want to calculate velocities in a plate tectonic setting, in this hot spot framework, then all you have to know is these numbers. And then if you know where you are in relation to that particular Euler pole, then you can figure out the velocities of the plate. So this is really a very, very powerful little table. We have now seen the plate velocities, we have seen the plate boundaries, and we have seen that we will treat the plate boundaries in today's lecture as rather sharp lines. So here are the divergent plate boundaries. This is the subduction zone. And what you see is that there are not just plate boundaries going over the planet, but there are places where three plate boundaries come together. And these are called triple junctions. So the Azores is, for example, a triple junction. There is a triple junction here because there is, a, of course, a, the plate boundary going into Africa and so forth and so forth. And these triple junctions basically 